I have an audience, I can start talking. Those guys can miss out. I don't care. All right. Hi, everyone. This is me. My name is Katie, and I work for Anchor Engineering Department. I'm probably going to try to keep to that one for pointing, just because most people are over there if I try to point. So, graphs. Graphs are fun. Management like graphs. They especially like when you spend a lot of time trying to make really fancy, intricate graphs. This is from real data that we got from our coffee shop about our month-long coffee consumption. They really liked this visualization. However, it took me longer than the amount of time I spent drinking coffee for the month to actually make the graph about how much coffee I was drinking in the month. This really, really doesn't scale. And the main problem that we have is, because we're a hosting company, we have a lot of streams of data that are coming in all the time and we do not have the resources to be able to make these highly customized graphs all the time. So I thought, why not make a thing that does it for you? And it doesn't care about all the intricate details because it'll make you define it what you want. So I made a system called Machiavelli, which is where the quote before or else be armed or graft comes from. There is one small problem with this. He didn't actually say that at all. Um, his actual quote is to do with having enough information and arguments to be able to back up the point that you're trying to make, which sort of works with the system anyway. The software, not the dead guy. I'll be talking about the dead guy less. So if I don't clarify, it's the software. There's four major aspects. I'll be covering data sources versus their stores, visualization, source logic, and stateless dashboards. Data sources and stores. There is, if you want to be able to break up feeds of information into two logical sections, you have the stores that actually hold the data that you read out of, such as JSON feeds, flat files, databases as opposed to the sources, which is the logical contextual representation of the information, such as here we have some RRD graphs and some OpenStack Horizon graphs. That's the logical representation of the data that we're given to be able to turn it from data into information, into knowledge. What I've done in my system is clearly define these two separate aspects as two different entities. So I have a set of libraries that read information from the data stores, being a database or a RESTful API, and then ones that represent all that information depending on the logic of it. So if you have a API that has a whole lot of information in it, you can graph it really easily as long as you can find two different things about it. The list of things that are available from your feed and the information from each individual feed. So one of the great things about this system that I've developed is you don't have to know before time what information you can get, just how to get it. So in this particular example, a Postgres connection string getting a list of metrics and then the same sort of information, getting information about a specific metric. This is all well and good, except the one thing that you need for any sort of graphing thing is you need to know ahead of time where these databases are. The one thing about Machiavelli that I think is really awesome that I've tried to keep in line with the original goals of the project is to have a completely stateless, the stateless dashboard and such. You can pull this entire system from GitHub and just change this one file and everything else will run itself. Touch wood, gremlins, all that kind of stuff. So, for any particular origin that we have, we define its store, its source, and other nice things. This is all human readable. This is the one thing you have to change when you set up your system. The particular sources and stores map directly to libraries about how to get the information, how to represent it, and then you could have your graph, which everything, the green mapping to the green and orange to orange, the colours are actually working, which is great. 
So that was probably really quick run through, but that's not the crux of the system. The crux of the entire thing here is it's really easy for a computer to get information. It's just how the human visualizes it that's really important. You can have your CSV tables or Excel spreadsheets, but what you really want is a way to be able to visualize change over time. This is really easy with metric data series, time series data sets. So what I've done is probably gotten really ahead of myself, I apologize. Um, I've made a completely isolated JavaScript library to render all these different metric data series. And this has all been packaged separately to the actual server side itself. And with any time series database, you'll be able to graphically represent that just by calling this particular library. There are a number of different visualizations that you can use, such as a squiggly line. You have a time series thing, time one has a value, time two has a value, and if you can graph that, you can see how things go up and down. This is really useful if you have no other information about what your data is about. It could be disk space. You could have disk going up, disk going down and such. As soon as you want to do cross correlations, then you want to add them on top of each other and you can have stacked graphs. So you can see that there's an inverse relationship between line blue and line green. When there's a Given all the setup that's been done with this system, you can have live representations of data, which means that you can have this kind of visualization where the most recent value is the one that's being represented with the number, and that can be updated as you go. So that would be really useful if you wanted, say, a war room board or a dashboard of all these metrics that live updates itself. In extreme circumstances, when you have very large fluctuations of data, this kind of visualization would be more appropriate, a horizon graph. This graph may be a little bit hard to read at first. However, if you've got a series of data, I'm using the mouse cursor, I hope you can see this, just so both look the same. You have a series of data that you then split into separate sections which you then colorize based on an increasing color depth. And then if you stack them on top of each other, you can see the exact same amount of data in a much smaller area. So instead of having all these things going down the page, you can stack them all on top of each other and still get the same representation. So a lot of the work that I did for this was that main crunching of how to get the data in, how to represent it. A lot of the good things about once you have all that legwork done is that you can have a whole lot of customizations based on what you're looking at. So when you have the available metadata, you can add things to it. So for example, in this particular instance, I've got a Nargios data source, Nargios being a metering and monitoring system. So if you know that you're looking at a Nargios data source and it just happens to represent itself as a CPU or a CPU idle metric, you can add gray to it. So Nargios itself doesn't have to return any of this stuff. One of the good things about the Machiavelli system is that it doesn't have to write anything to these external data sources. It can add it all dynamically. As soon as you start adding in your own metadata, you can create colorful graphs which actually have a human representable logic to them. So user CPU being the default blue, IO weight being the default red, and then you can start really working with your data in a nice extendable way. Because of all these aspects and all the moving parts, Another thing I've tried to do with this system is to make it completely stateless. So 
all the different representations, the different graph types, zooms, metrics, they're all actually embedded into the one URL and you can copy paste that, you can enter it in all in on a standard keyboard and then you can copy that URL across through emails, instant messages, as long as you have authenticated access to the server itself, you should be able to load the exact same representation of that data, which makes it very useful if you start having dashboards of your favorite servers, your most vulnerable processes, and then you can have a very quick way to be able to, in a, say, a crisis mode, go, I need to work out what's happening on this entire fleet of servers, give me all the graphs, and there's your graphs. This probably makes a whole lot more sense if I actually demonstrate it, and hopefully this will work. Which button am I pressing? Can we read that at the back? Yep. Okay, so for the sysadmin nerds in the room, there may be some of you, this is running on an OpenStack instance with a default installation of Nginx and Unicorn. All the configs for this are on the GitHub repo, so you should be able to run this up. What I have is a series of data stores that I've defined in that YAML. That's all I've done for this system. I've got a library that reads CSV files in a certain format, and I've got a library file that reads the New Relic API. Everything else is being done automatically based on the information it's given. So, this bomb data, what I've got is a job that pulls off the publicly accessible JSON files from the Bureau of Meteorology website every day to bring up the temperature, humidity, all that kind of fun stuff from the Weather Bureau to be able to show changes in temperature for across a whole lot of different sites. So when you start, it suggests maybe you want to search for something if you haven't got anything selected, doing the whole human thing. Click on search and you get a box and you can start typing into that box and you will get a nicely searchable list of things with highlights based on your search results. If I can spell, are you serious? Come on, okay. So in this particular data set, I have a whole lot of the major Bureau of Meteorology sites for Sydney, and we can add all of these search results, and then we can click render, which will pull all the information out of all of the files that I have locally stored. By default, that's not going to work because I do get it once a day and it's now very late in the afternoon. So we have data. The only thing that Machiavelli is doing in this case is saying, I want to get this first one, Campbelltown temperature. It goes through all the files, works out what's there based on the metadata of the JSON feeds, and then pulls it all into an XY array. That's all it does. And then the graphing library goes, I have an XY, I'm going to graph it, that's all I do. Very isolated, localized things. So we have a list of a whole lot of temperature for Sydney, which is really exciting for those people that are from the Gold Coast. However, remember how I said that we can start stacking these on top of each other? We can click our graph and change any of these visualizations on the fly. All of this, if I press my wonderful button, I can copy this URL around at any time. How many people have tried to play with query strings and worked out their limitations in the lack of RFC actual spec documentation? Yeah. You see these tildes? Tildes are useful. There's a very, very small subset of characters that you can actually use in a query string because there are special characters such as ampersand and equals. So there was a whole lot of logic to try to work out how to represent an array in a query string. If you'll excuse me for one moment, this appears to have crashed. Okay, so one thing this doesn't do at the moment is actually do cross interpolation natively. What you want to be able to do at any one time is have a known set of data 
that has the exact same points. The graphing library I'm using here is really pedantic about that, so I need to actually remove the ones that I know to possibly be wrong. <coughs> Why is it not working? This is Gremlins, I swear this is Gremlins. On the week view, one of them had a, a slightly longer data set. Yeah, um, possibly. This is really annoying because this was, I swear this was working 15 minutes ago, I swear. Blame the bomb. I'm, I'm going to blame the bomb. Okay, the bomb doesn't care. This whole gov hack thing is a load of bollocks because <laughs> one of the only live data sources you can actually get is the bomb. You can get it live if you pull it at any time of day, but you have to keep on pulling it and it's only half an hour resolution. So let's debug this together, shall we? Up the very top. If you yeah. Oh well, that's the problem. Uh, okay, we we have different data sets, so yeah. <laughs> end date of yesterday, you reckon? Okay, we have stop and starts and such. This particular view is relative time, so if you were to copy this URL, it would be one week from whenever you loaded the page, and we are going to go up till one day ago. So this looks slightly better. Let's. Ray. There should be a whole lot of logic to be able to do this regardless of where you're pulling the information from and that didn't work. <sighs> Serious, I really don't want to be diving into code issues. You reckon Holsworthy was the bad one? Yeah. Gremlins, Gremlin dance, it wasn't Holsworthy. Maybe it's Observatory Hill. <sighs> oh my God, how embarrassment. Um, I need to work on this. That's definitely something I will need to do. It was Terry Hills. See, Terry Hills has definitely got less data. So let's add everything for temperature and then remove Terry Hills and then try to graph it. Observatory Hill as well. Yep. Do, do, do. We can just fix this in post, yeah? <laughs> okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. We have graphs. Thank you. you I'll be here all week. No. But on the plus side, you found missing data with your graphing library. Yes. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, one of the things I do need to do in this is when you have disparate time series, there really should be underlying libraries to be able to do interpolation and steps regardless. This entire system was originally built just to handle our own database type, like we literally built a database. You can see a whole lot more about that if you come to LCA. <coughs> um, but a whole lot of the interpolation logic sits in that library and I do need to expand that out. So now we have graphs. So, what can we see just from this visualization? All I've done is eventually stack them on top of each other. We can see that the blue line likes to highlight everything, come on. Okay, this blue line is Gosford and it doesn't go as high as all the other lines. That's the data that we're given. What we can do from there is work out from that information we can then ascertain knowledge about the system or what's going on here. So. I'm going to take a guess that Holsworthy and Campbelltown are in the west, Gosford's well north of all that. I'm guessing there was some sort of pressure system that was making Gosford um, a lower temperature. If we were to zoom into this, we can see a whole lot more details. So this particular one is six o'clock at night. You can tell during the day everything goes down and then goes back up again and there's clouds and there's possible spikes in our data and such and such. What I could also do here, now, this may not work. <laughs> I have a whole lot of new relic data as well. So what I could do is I can go CPU, which isn't gonna work because it's all silly. Because of all the work that I did trying to make all the data sets cross-reliable, you should be able to do interpolations and 
correlations on any different input of data at the same time <sighs> should. Let's ignore that, okay. Uh, UX, UX is fun, UX won't break. Oh God, okay. In an ideal world, this would just work. What you should be able to do is copy that URL and everything will work. What you can also do is go into absolute time and you can have historical queries and all this is, all it's doing is just changing the query string inputs and you can go back to relative time, which is a rocket ship because relativity, and you can change to UTC and you can change to local time. This is being used internally, but for internal data sets and internal data sources that I cannot show here because it's internal data, this is something that I will fix, I swear to you. All the source code's up here if you want to hack on it, seriously. Um, we, we do have, as much as we can, a whole lot of our engineering stuff, open source. Most of it's hacked school. This stuff's Ruby, though, so uptake people. And unless there's any other questions, I think I'm, I've, I've about had it, so yes. <laughs> Anything. Okay, I'll go over there um, later. So the data sources that I have, it, it's based on the human representation. The data stores, though, it can do, it can, uh, the main one's Voltaire. This was all meant to do Voltaire, which is our Haskell database backed onto Ceph. It's a whole lot of the other ones though haven't been tested as well because we don't have a use for it. All of our system metrics now go into the one place. It's like using Postgres and then wanting to test it for MySQL. OpenStack. <laughs> <laughs> Someone got that, yes. I, there does need to be a whole lot more testing and a whole lot more robustness for this, which is why everything failed. But by default, it'll do flat files, it'll do databases, it'll do our database, it will do JSON in a predefined way, and it will also do API calls. So if that new Relic stuff wanted to work, I could have shown you that if this was data for the server that actually ran the Bureau of Meteorology, you could see the hit counts for the Bureau of Meteorology site going up as the temperature decreased because of the change that came in and started flooding everything. So you can do that sort of thing. And if you have that honed enough, you can start doing predictive modeling where you can tell that, oh, the temperature's dropped, there's a possibility of showers, we may want to start expanding our stack so everyone can see our information, for example. There was a question on this side, if somebody still had their hand up. There was up. a data source question about graphite and yeah. Okay, this is all built on the attempts that people have made to make graphite not horrible. Um, Tazio, the tea leaf stuff is where I gleaned that from. Uh, there's also Descartes and Giraffe. So what they were trying to do was have graphite as the source and then some of them decided to branch out to Librato and Cube, I think. Um, but what I tried to do was not to have it based on graphite as the default, have it based on our stuff as the default, but grow from there. Obviously it's not robust enough because my presentation didn't work. However, it's still a work in progress. It's only been a few months in the making. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it was that kind of concept where originally I just wanted to see whether any of those would take a database. The horizon charts there actually have their own JavaScript contexts to be able to call directly to the databases. So that's the sort of thing that I based it on, where you can just change the context to be graphite or librato or something, and then it'll just work on the JavaScript level. One thing that this does do though is reserve all the data in itself. So you don't have to have access to graphite itself, which is really good. Um, one thing that I have recently added because I realized it was a great big security vulnerability was in the settings, it's masked my New Relic API key on purpose, so you shouldn't be able to hack me. I hope you can't just with the application ID, but it's, it's just for this demo side, so please don't. <laughs> if there's no other questions, 
this might actually be the first talk that's finished on time, but it's not. Hi. Um, we can fix that. Okay. We, we, we've built, well, uh, the press is building a similar -ish system mm -hmm. um, that takes data from all over everything we can possibly think of getting data from, like, you know, CPU temperature or the syslog messages or what have you, throwing it all into a giant Elasticsearch system that, you know, stuff to deal with, like, thousands of messages a second. Um, and then that gets all pulled out of the graph. So I'm just sort of thinking of you, or asking, have you thought about centralizing your data store around, so, around something like Elasticsearch, so, well, for example, so instead of dealing with all these different format inputs, transform them, put them into a giant thing, and then you're just dealing with one sort of data, data form. <laughs> Um, I, I can repeat the question so you don't have to. He, he was asking whether we want to use the evil of Elasticsearch to duplicate all the data. Elasticsearch has had a whole lot of fun things. Uh, we do actually use Elasticsearch because our main vault system doesn't have sufficiently efficient searching for metric names at the moment, so we do cache that in, electric, in Elasticsearch. Electric search, that would be fun. It zaps you. No, it does that anyway. <laughs> Elasticsearch is in a time series data store, so you can't store that kind of stuff and documents and everything else and expect it to still be effective. Plus the... It does do time series. It's got features for that. We've been using it for time series and it works. Yeah, we kind of built our own. Um, <laughs> But another thing that it wouldn't do very well is the fact that you have to duplicate everything. So we've got an entire multi-rack Ceph cluster storing all this data and we have 15 second resolution of our entire fleet going back months and it's only about a terabyte. So we have a highly, highly scalable solution for that already. And th this system is based directly off that, but I do need to work on the correlations to make sure that any external source can just work as, as you saw. But the, the Elasticsearch stuff does work for its context. Um, we do have a whole caching for that, as I said, but it, it does have its limitations, such as um, the OpenStack Solometer developers have realized where they're trying to use a Postgres database as a document storage system and time series data set, which is why they're rewriting it all called, okay, you want a great thing? If you haven't heard this, it's amazing. Solometer is a whole lot of spaghetti code at the moment. They're rewriting it to not be spaghetti code and they're literally calling it gnocchi. I swear to you that is true. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Last questions. Hi. Did you have an example of the, the tea leaf visualization? It won't work in this particular case because I'm unable to get the live data at the moment. So it's literally, if you have a live data set, so if you have your live new relics actually working, it will show the value of the last item on there and then do the things. Um, yeah. I might actually make a proper video of the visualizations and then post that up along with the talk slides. That might actually be useful. Uh, ETA on that, no idea. However, it is 1.30 on the dot and I know that we want to run on time. Is that right? people that were supposed to tell me five minutes ago that I had five minutes left, yes. <laughs> it is so good at it, so. <laughs> Yay. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs>